Let's open up our Bibles to the uh, fifth chapter of the book of Hebrews as we make our way verse by verse, Genesis to Revelation. And I think that the passage that we have before us is very timely for where we find ourselves this time of year. Because usually it's in this time of year where we, um, we decide that we'd like to see the upcoming year uh, be a little bit more fruitful than what the past year was. And so we want to quit smoking and we want to... You know, we want to lose weight, want to read more stories to our kids, whatever. And, um, and, and the subject matter of, of both the end of chapter 5, the four verses that we're going to cover this morning, and the beginning verses of chapter 6, it's going to be dealing with the issue of, of um, immaturity, spiritual immaturity. And I, I don't think that there would be a better resolution uh, for you and I to be able to make in the upcoming year to be a more... Uh, mature follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I, I don't think that there really is, is anything better that we could you know, want to become uh, than, than that. Now, it's, it's interesting to me where, where we find ourselves with, within our culture. And I think, I think that what's going on in our culture is very similar to what was going on with these Hebrew believers. And I think that what was going on with these Hebrew believers kind of parallels what we see going on in the American church today. Um, you know, we're, we're Americans, and one of the problems about being American is we just think everything revolves around us. And uh, because I think of our own pride and our own self-importance, that oftentimes it blinds us to, to the reality of what really is going on in the world around us. There, there is this center of gravity of Christianity. And what I mean by that is that if we had five believers up against this wall over here, and we got five believers up against this wall over here. Well, I'm standing in the center of gravity. I've got equal weight on both sides of me. Now, let's say that the numbers don't change on this side, but the numbers double on this side. So now we've got 10 believers over here. So we've got twice the weight over here than we have over there. And so that means that now the center of gravity is going to move over probably around where that keyboard stand is going to be. Now, we can, we can tell where the Lord is moving in the world just simply by watching the historic gravity of where Christianity has been throughout history. For example, if you look at a world map, you go back to the beginning, 33 AD, and wh where is the center of gravity? Obviously, it's going to be right there in Jerusalem. That's where all the believers are at, right? Now, we know from reading the book of Acts and from the writings of the Apostle Paul that, that even though there was growth in North Africa, there's growth in other parts of the Mideast, we're able to see that where the church was really exploding and really beginning to make significant inroads into the Roman Empire was through Asia Minor. You remember that Paul said all, all of Asia has had a presentation of the gospel. All of Asia has been uh, simply ev evangelized. And so probably around eight, 900 AD, the center of gravity moved into what we would know today as northwestern Turkey. Well, again, growth continues in Europe. It continues to go westward so that by the time we're around 1500, the center of gravity for Christianity was in northern Italy. Now, in between 1500 and 1900, you had the Welsh revival. You have, um, you have the Reformation making tremendous cultural changes with, within northern and, and western Europe. You've got the Great Awakening in the 1700s. You've got these revivals throughout the 1800s in the United States so that there was this huge push between 1500 and 1900 so that now, going westward, you find the center of gravity right around central Spain. Now, there's a very interesting thing that then happens between 1900 and 1970. We notice now that the center of gravity moves more southward than westward. All of a sudden, there's tremendous revivals that's taking place in Africa. There's, there's wonderful things that were, uh, that were happening in South America, Latin America. Now, today, all of a sudden, now we begin to see that shifting eastward. As we begin to see many Muslim countries beginning to experience revival, we're seeing what's going on in, in Asia, and, and yet we continue to see this southerly trend, and so by 2050, the center of gravity is going to be somewhere around northern Nigeria. Now, there are many different ways that you can divide the world. One of the ways that we divide the world is that we've got global north and global south. Global north is the developed part of the world. Global south is the developing part of the world. Global north is predominantly white and wealthy. Global south is predominantly 
people of color and a great deal of, of poverty. There's, a, there, there's a, a greater poverty rate there. Now, one of the great lies that is being believed in the world is that somehow Christianity is a white man's religion. And nothing could be farther from the truth. I mean, first of all, do we understand that we are worshiping uh, a man of color, right? Jesus is not a white guy. And most of the people that are worshiping this individual of color, that they are people of color uh, themselves. In fact, Philip Jenkins, a historian from uh, Penn State University, said today, 60% of the estimated 2 billion Christians live in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. By 2050, there'll be an estimated 3 billion Christians, 75% of whom uh, will, will live in what is uh, the global south. So the body of Christ is becoming darker and the body of Christ is, is becoming poorer. But here's an interesting thing. Churches that live in the global south have a more conservative view of the word of God and hold to a greater authority on the word of God than churches in global north. In fact, we, we can tell this by certain denominations that are, are very, uh, very liberal and we look at their churches in Global North, they have a very loose grip upon uh, the authority of Scripture. But those same denominations having churches in Global South, those churches hold on to a, uh, an idea that the Word of God has authority. Now, it's interesting to me, where is God moving in the world today? He's moving in those parts of the world that hold to a very high view of Scripture. Again, you go back to what's going on in Africa. There is now over 631 million Christians uh, living in Africa. Uh, the American thinker tells us that every day there are 16,000 Muslims in Africa that are converting to Christianity. Pew Research tells us this. The demography, if demography is destiny, then Christianity Christianity's future lies in Africa. By 2060, more than 40% of the world's Christians uh, will call sub-Saharan Africa home. So it's very intriguing to me that we're able to see that, look, this is where God is at work in our world. Now, we live in a culture where we are witnessing believers loosening their grip upon the authority of the Word of God. That is exactly what was happening as we're going to be going through Hebrews. That's exactly what we find going on with these believers. All of a sudden, there are other voices in their life that they're listening to their family, they're listening to their friends, and they are turning a deaf ear to the authority of the Word of God. Now, Philip Hughes tells us this. He says, if there is a widespread unfamiliarity with the book of Hebrews and its teaching, it is because so many adherents of the church have, a, have settled for a superficial association with the Christian faith. Yet Hebrews was written to arouse such persons from the lethargic state of compromise and complacency into which they had sunk. Hebrews is a tonic for the spiritually debilitated. We neglect such a book to our own impoverishment. So this is a very timely study for us, that what we see happening with these first century believers, I think we're beginning to see also in the Western civilizations the same thing going on in the churches all around us. Now, where do we pick it up in verse 11? He wants to get into a subject, but he is afraid that this subject is going to be very difficult for these believers to wrap their heads around. Now, when you go to a Bible study and you leave the Bible study more confused than you were before you even got there, there are a number of reasons why that might have taken place. There, there are three possible reasons why you can struggle with an interpretation of Scripture. The first reason might be due to the teacher. The person that's leading the Bible study is just very ill-equipped to be leading a Bible study. They haven't put in the work necessary. They don't know the material well enough. They're shifting papers all around. They're all discombobulated, and you have no idea what the person was trying to tell you. Sometimes it's the fault of the teacher. Sometimes it's just the subject matter that's there. It's just a, it's one of those subjects in Scripture that, for the most part, is kind of shrouded in mystery. It's kind of shrouded in darkness. It's only mentioned once in the Scripture, and then it disappears. And it's like, well, gee, there's nothing I can compare this to. And, and so it's just a difficult subject. Sometimes it might be due to the audience, and I think that that is the problem that we have here. 
You see, he's trying to teach algebra to your average three-year-old that doesn't know how to add and subtract. There's going to be great difficulty there. Now, what he's going to be telling us is, is that I really want to get into this. It is important that you know this, but you aren't at a level of maturity that you need to be. So we're going to find some very challenging things. Now, in chapter five, he's going to identify what immaturity is. And then next week, when we get together in chapter six, he's going to be talking about the solution of spiritual immaturity. Now, notice where he he takes us here. Beginning of verse 11, he says this. Now, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. Now, notice he says, of whom? There is a guy. There's a guy I want to talk about. There's a guy that you need to know about. Now, who is he talking about? Well, what was the last thing that we read in verse 10? He said, Jesus now is a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom? All right, this is the guy that I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about this cat, Melchizedek. There's some important things that we need to understand about this guy. Now, he doesn't say it's going to be hard because this is rocket science. He doesn't say it's going to be hard because I'm not talking to anybody that's got their PhD in theology. Notice he gives us the reason. Since this is why it's hard. Since you have become. Very interesting. They have done this to themselves. The verb tense here is in the active form. That this is what they have done to themselves. You see, they have allowed themselves. And this is the interesting thing about spiritual growth. See, what spiritual growth is, is continuing to paddle against the current. And you cannot stop paddling against the current. If you stop paddling against the current, guess what? The current begins to push you back. The minute you and I decide that we're going to stop pursuing what God has for our life, we're not going to be able to pause for a couple of years and then go back and pick it up where we left off. We're always going to lose ground the minute that we stop paddling, all right? Now, a lot of times we think when there are these collapses in our life, that they happen because of one big bad decision that we made. Now look, a passionate follower of the Lord Jesus Christ is not that one day, and then the very next day they're running off as somebody else's spouse. That's not how it works. You don't find yourself in a place of collapse because of something that has taken place overnight. But you're able to look back, aren't you? When you've had these collapses in your life, you're able to look back and you're able to see, you know, I decided to do this, and then I made this choice here. And then I made this choice here, and then it led me to here, and now it led me into this mess that I find myself in. It's not one big bad decision. It is a thousand little bitty horrible decisions that take place over a period of time. And this is what they have done to themselves. Now, what have they done? Notice that you have become dull of hearing. Now, Abbott and Smith's Greek lexicon tells us this. This means that these believers had become sluggish and slothful when it came to wanting to know uh, God's word. There, there was a point where they decided that God's word wasn't that important. They decided that it wasn't to be that monumental uh, in our life. Now, Philip Hughes makes an interesting point here. He says, during the great, uh, during, uh, Kent Hughes rather, during the great awakenings in the 1700s of America, there was a sudden rise in interest in shorthand because people wanted to hear the word of God And to take accurate notes so that they could understand it, it was this passion to know God's word that woke up America. So they're at this Bible study. This pastor talks way too fast. I'd like to take some notes here. And so I'm going to have to learn shorthand so I can be able to go back and reflect upon what it was that I was taught. They took a very serious interest in the word of God. And look at what happened to the United States all along the eastern seaboard, up and down the eastern seaboard. There were tremendous things that took place because the church decided that it was going to take the word of God seriously. And now what we find here is that notice that he is saying, now you, you become dull. It's not that important. You, you, your, your approach on the word of God is, well, that, you know, whatever. It's, it's just no big deal. Now, you remember that Jesus tells us a very important thing. And again, when it comes to spiritual development, the moment you stop, the moment you stop pursuing what it is that God has for you, You're going to go the other direction. It's not that you're going to hold your ground. Remember that Jesus said in in Luke's gospel chapter eight, he said, now you be careful how you listen for whoever has a teachable heart to him, more understanding will be given. And whoever does not have a longing for truth, 
Even what he thinks he has will be taken away from him. Now, I have seen this over and over in my life where there's a person, they're, they're growing in their faith, they're maturing in their faith, and then all of a sudden, they begin to think that they're the smartest person in the room. They begin to think they're the most spiritual individual in the church, and they know it all. They, and, and there isn't anything that you and I can add to their spiritual understanding whatsoever. And the moment you think that you're the smartest, the most spiritual person going, that's the moment that your spiritual, um, your spiritual development is going to come to a hold. Or you get angry with God. You're mad at God. God's not doing what you wanted God to do. God didn't heal your grandma. God didn't heal your child. God didn't give you the promotion. God, whatever. It's, it's always God's fault, isn't it? And so now you become God's judge. What can be more prideful than that? You're standing as God, uh, as the judge of the God of, of all of the universe. And the moment we allow that to creep into our life, spiritual development is going to come to an end. And we become dull and we stop placing an importance upon the authority of the word of God. Now notice what he then says in verse 12. For though by, by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. Now, look, there's a difference between maturity and old age. Right? Now, maturity, maturity, that speaks of depth. Old age, it speaks of length. Now, you can have great length, but you can have a lot of shallowness to your life. We can have somebody 90 years old. They've always been in the church. They were raised in the church. But they can be a very shallow individual. Well, we can then have a teenager freshly comes to Christ. They're at every Bible study. They're at every prayer meeting. They're, they're seeking God and his will every day of, uh, of their life. And after a year or two, uh, there, there's great depth there. And so even though there hasn't been much length to their life, there's a lot of depth there. And there's more depth in that teenager than there is in that 90-year-old person that has been in the church forever and ever. And this is what he's talking about here. There's no depth to you guys. You guys should be at a place now where your teachers... Now, he's not saying everybody in church needs to be writing commentaries. He's not saying that all of us by now, we ought to have our PhDs and we ought to be teaching theology in some Christian university. What he is simply saying is, is that all of us should be able at some point in time to give a reasonable answer for the hope that lies within us. All of us should be able uh, on some level to talk about the superiority of the gospel of grace and the superiority of the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice that he says to them, he says that you now have to be taught the first principles. Now what first principles means here is the ABCs. He's wanting to teach them Shakespeare and they don't even know the alphabet. Now notice they used to know the alphabet, used to know this. Now we got to go back over it again. You see, you began to pull yourself away from submitting to the authority of the word of God and, and you've been losing ground for how long we do not know. But now we got to go right back over it again and we got we to gotta give you uh, the ABCs. You're not, you're not ready uh, to, uh, to comprehend this, right? So there's nothing wrong with the ABCs. There's, not, not, there's nothing wrong with, with the elementary truths of the gospel. These are wonderful, and we should all know them. But look, the ABCs of Christianity are not to be a parking lot. They're to be a launching pad, and they are to lead you into a deeper experience with the creator that is deeply in love with you. Now, notice that he then says in verse 13, he says, For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. And then notice what he calls him here. This is terribly offensive, isn't it? For, for he is a babe. Now, these, these believers were in need of milk. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with milk. I mean, if you've had, if you had a little baby, you understand, well, we've got to give this human being milk for a certain period of time as their digestive system begins to develop, as they begin to mature. We then begin to introduce solid food. But look, if you've got a 30-year-old that's still on formula... You got a problem, right? You got a problem. And if you're an individual that has been a follower of Christ and claiming faith in Christ for decades, and you're still on milk, there's a problem that we have here. Now look, the milk of the word is that Jesus died for me. And what a wonderful truth. And we should rehearse that truth in our minds over and over again. But that's the milk of the word. The meat of the word is that I died with him. 
the meat of the word is that I was crucified with him. Nevertheless, I live. And so what is this crucified life? What, is this, what does this look like? Now, notice that this steady diet of milk, the reason for it, notice that he says, because you are unskilled. Now, this word unskilled is a very interesting word. It means inexperienced in or without experience of. In other words, the word of righteousness, the word of God is something that you do not have a personal experience with. And because you don't have a personal experience with it, you look, look, when you got a little baby, um, you, you got to feed that baby, right? That baby needs to be fed. You, you know, you give them the bowl of food and you give them a spoon, well, you got a mess to clean up because they cannot feed themselves, right? We've all experienced that. But there comes a point that as that human being begins to develop, they can feed themselves and they can become acquainted with food all by themselves. And by the time they're a teenager, you can kiss everything in that fridge goodbye, right? They are very adept at feeding themselves. And the same thing should be true also in the spiritual realm. That look, you come here, I, I share the word of God with you, I continue to remind you of these things, but you also have to remember that you have the Holy Spirit that is dwelling in your heart, and you are to have a personal relationship with the word of righteousness. And throughout the week, you should be just breathing a simple prayer to the Lord. Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a chapter here in the book of Mark, and Lord, would your Holy Spirit enlighten my understanding and, and give me instruction. And that's our problem with the church in America, we just do not have a personal experience with the word of God, and it is producing an immaturity where we are witnessing now the loss of our uh, culture. Now, look, you, you ask a person, you, you, this happens all the time, you ask a person, you find out that they're, they're going to church somewhere, and you say, why do you go to that church? And they'll say, well, you know, my kids like it there, and that's where their friends are at. Or, you know, we like the worship band this year. We like the music. Or we like the drama team. Or we, our, our family goes there. And so I'm, I'm comfortable there. When was the last time you heard somebody say, I go there because I need to know what God has said? And because that is what is absent from the church, the church is totally anemic in the Western world of changing or impacting its culture at all. Now he calls them a babe. Now, what is a babe? How do you know that you're a babe? Well, notice, first of all, he says, you lack understanding the word of God. You do not have a working knowledge of the word of God. Spiritually, you are a babe. Now, look, if you just got saved, no problem. You should be a babe, right? But if you have been in the body of Christ for decades, you ought to have a working knowledge of scripture. The same thing that we see in babies is they love to fight with other Christians. You put two toddlers in a room. You put one toy in the room. You end up with the UFC, don't you? Because you got two people there that are completely and totally self-centered. They don't know anything about being other-centered. And also, they are always being offended. The easier it is to offend you, it is a greater insight to where you are with your spiritual maturity. And number four, you're jealous over the success of others because you're consumed with yourself. That success should be me. That limelight ought to be placed upon me. That promotion ought to be given to me. Now, notice how he closes this out in verse 14. He says, but solid food belongs to those who are of a full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern now both good and evil. So notice now another sign of immaturity here is that there's no discernment. Not able to figure out, hey, this is of God, this is not of God. Now where does our discernment derive from? It comes from the old revelation. You remember that Jude said, the truth of God has been delivered to the church once and for all. All truth, all revelation has been given to the church in the first century. Whatever revelation comes our way in the day and the hour that we're living in now always has to be tested against the old revelation. Now we're heading into tax time. And so you come up to me and you say, thus saith the Lord. You can cheat on your taxes, and whatever you save, it's okay with God as long as you tithe 10% of your savings to the church. Now, is this person of God, or is this person trying to deceive me? Well, I go back. This is new revelation, so I got to go back to the old revelation. What does the old revelation do? Well, the old revelation tells me I got to be truthful. 
The old revelation tells me I need to give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. The old revelation tells me I need to submit to the government as long as the government's not asking me to do an unbiblical thing, right? And so what does the old revelation tell me? It tells me that this guy is a nut job and I need to separate myself from them because they, they don't know anything. You see, as we are exercising ourselves, now notice the, the language that he's using there. You're putting it in use. You're exercising it. You're personally acquainted with it. And what is the result of that? Well, you got some, you got some spiritual sense here. You're able to figure out what's right and wrong. You're able to figure out what is of God and what's not of God. You're able to say, this person is of God, this person over here, this, this person is not of God. Now, what do we see going on in the United States right now? This is very interesting to me. Only 22% of Americans believe that the Bible is the actual word of God and is to be taken literally. Now, 28% believe that it is the actual word of God, but it has multiple possible interpretations. So I read a verse and I say, all right, this is what this verse means to me. And then you read the verse and you say, all right, well, that means that to him, but it means this to me. So you end up with a lot of confusion. 28% believes that it is the inspired word of God and it's not to be taken literally. What that means is, is that you need the professor to take you by a hand and to walk you through the Bible and to point out those parts of the Bible that are inspired. You see what Paul said here? I don't know what he was thinking about. That is not inspired, and you don't have to pay attention to that. What Peter says here, oh, this is good. This is inspired. You need to pay attention to it. Mark said this, yes, that's right. You need to do what he tells you to do right here. And what they are doing, they're taking a pen knife to the word of God, and interestingly enough, they're cutting out those parts of the Bible that bug them. 18% believe that it is a book of fables, and 4% uh, believe uh, that they, they, they don't have any idea. They don't know. Now, it's very interesting. Francis Schaeffer said, you tell me what the world is saying today, and I will tell you what the church is going to be saying seven years from now. And this is what we call culture creep. And this is what we are seeing in the church today, that it is the culture that is creeping into the church, and it is changing the church. It is not that the church is being the light and being a force of truth in the culture, but we are being squeezed into the mold of our culture. I just, I just read this week that the Church of England, that they are having transition baptisms. And so if in, in earlier years uh, you were a male and you were baptized, then now you can come back to the Church of England if you're transitioning now into female, and they will baptize you as a female. That, that's culture creep. That's the thought of the culture creeping in. Now, there was a book that was written a number of years ago by Carl Wilson called Our Dance Has Turned to Death. And what he did is that he studied all of these cultures throughout history, the, these cultures that at one time knew God, these cultures that at, at one time, they were missionary sending cultures. They were cultures that were impacting the world around them. And basically, the thrust of the book, he says that the family with traditional religious roles for men and women in a lifelong monogamous marriage relationship is the abiding natural foundation for social order, happiness, and stability. When that view is abandoned for selfish individualisms, the society, notice, might, he says, no, the society will collapse and die. It happens every time. He laid out six steps that a society goes through. Now, as we look at these six, you tell me where the United States is right now. He said, in stage number one, men cease to lead their families in worship. Spiritual and moral development became secondary. Where all of this gets started is that you've got men that decide that they are not going to be spiritual human beings. All of a sudden, you've got men that are pulling away from their relationship with the Lord, and instead of seeking the Lord and his will for the man's life and for the man's family life and for the man's church, all of a sudden, he begins to pursue these other things. Pulling away from God then, the second stage, men selfishly neglect the care of their wives and children to pursue material wealth, political and military power. Material values begin to dominate thought. They pull away from God, and then they begin to pull away from their family. All of a sudden now, spiritual training in the home is the work of women. You take those kids to church. You pray with those kids at night. You, you read the Bible to those kids. That's not my responsibility, and that is a lie from the pit. The third stage is that they are involved in a change of men's sexual values. Men who are preoccupied with business or war either neglected their wife's sexual began to involve themselves with other, other uh, women or with homosexuality. Then in the fourth stage, uh, the role of women at home with children lost value. 
Women were neglected and their roles devalued. Soon they revolted to gain access to material wealth and also freedom for sex outside of marriage. Marriage laws were changed to make divorce easier. Then in the fifth stage, husbands and wives competed against each other for money, home leadership, and the affection of their children. This resulted in hostility, frustration, and possible homosexuality in the children. Many children were unwanted, aborted, molested, undisciplined. The more undisciplined children became, the more social pressure there was not to have children. And then in the sixth stage, selfish individualism grew, carried over into society, fragmenting it into smaller and smaller group loyalties. The nation was thus weakened by internal conflict. Welcome to America. The decrease in the birth rate produced an older population that had less ability to defend itself and less will to do so, making the nation more vulnerable to its enemies. And then finally, unbelief in God became more complete. Parental authority diminished. Ethical and moral principles disappeared, affecting the economy and the government. And thus, by internal weakness and fragmentation, the societies came apart and there was no way to save them except by a dictator who arose from within or barbarians who invaded from without. Now, where do you put the United States there? We know where we're going. And you and I are called to be the light. You and I are called to be the salt. We are to be a preserving force in our culture. Now, circling back finally, Francis Schaeffer. Shortly before the man's death, he said this, I see a great dark age coming upon Western civilization. And if it comes, it will be the Christian in America that will be held accountable at the judgment seat of Jesus Christ for the fall of Western civilization. Why? Because we had all of the Bible studies, the theology, the institutions that for hundreds of years had been the dream of other nations. And we let it go in the lifetime of one man. I pray that in 2019, that the Holy Spirit would so work in your heart that there would be a greater commitment on your part to have a relationship with the authority of the Word of God and that you would understand that the teacher resides in you. And Jesus said, I am sending you so that he will remind you of everything that I've taught you so that he will lead and guide you into truth. And I pray that if the Lord wills and we find ourselves here at the same spot next year, that I'm going to be looking at individuals and a congregation that has lived a year being committed to what God has said. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And I pray that you and I take it more seriously this year so that we might play a part of impacting Western civilization. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I would ask, Lord, that you would help us to overcome uh, the path of least resistance. Lord, that path, it just, it leads away from spiritual development, spiritual maturity. Just so easy, just to veg out, just turn on TV, just spend our evening checking our email or Facebook, whatever. Lord, Lord, I pray that we would we would have some sort of sense of urgency that would begin to arise in our heart, that we would recognize that, that we're losing. We're losing the culture rapidly. We've, we've awakened into a world this morning that if you, if you use the wrong pronoun, you can lose your job. It's just, it's insanity what is beginning to happen all around us. And I, I pray, Father, that when we are witnessing Lord, the, the, the enemy just coming in like a flood, as Isaiah had prophesied, that you would raise up a standard. And the standard that you would raise up would be the authority of your word being lived out in the lives of your people. So Lord, help us in this coming year to take you and your word more seriously. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand.